Hi guys, thanks for joining us. Welcome to the Three Pillars podcast with your host Griselda Barreto. Today we'll be speaking on the second pillar of writing. Today's guest is Bridget Chambers. Bridget Chambers has spent the better part of a decade building and refining her own private practice where she serves as a life coach, writer and Generation Y personal development expert. She has enabled a myriad of people to move from doubt to direction by implementing a unique plot twist approach which puts a client in charge of his or her own life. Through one-on-one coaching sessions, speaking engagements and contributions to the media, she finds deep joy in piecing together all the small pictures that form the intricate mosaics of her clients' lives. Hi Bridget, welcome to The Three Pillars. How are you doing? I'm doing great, Griselda. Um, Thank you so, so much for having me on today. I'm so looking forward to chatting with you. Oh, it's my pleasure to have you on as well. I'm really looking forward to speaking to you because your your personality is amazing. Um, But (laughs) before, (laughs) uh, before, oh, thank you. Uh, Before we go ahead, could I just ask you to give me, you know, to tell our listeners a little bit about who you are and how you actually became a writer. Sure, absolutely. Um, Thanks for asking. So I, to give you kind of the shortened version of a long story, I went to college for, to become an English teacher. And I always loved reading and I always loved writing. I seemed to excel in language arts classes. And I I always had a passion for for storytelling um, from a very young age. And so that was what I thought I wanted to study. And as I started my classes, at Marquette University in Wisconsin, I quickly kind of realized that maybe my love for writing and reading would maybe get lost on students who maybe didn't love it as much as I did. And I thought maybe the path of teaching reading and writing wasn't exactly a fit for me. And so I decided to actually transfer schools and I went on to study business and writing at Columbia College in Chicago. And from there, I decided to dabble in life coaching. I always seem, when I wrote, I always seemed to enjoy nonfiction writing where I was more commenting on the world or, you know, making commentary on relationships or how we get through things or, you know, being transparent about transferring colleges and, you know, having other people who had similar stories relate and and write back and forth with me. So, I ended up graduating college. I went to life coaching school and got a certification in coaching. And then I parlayed that into a business where I both served as a life coach and a writer. And so I've since um, written for lots of different publications, um, Huffington Post, Thrive, Global, different magazines. Um, I was featured in Chicken Soup for the Soul. uh, And I just submitted my first full-length book, uh, nonfiction book to uh, agents. And so I I just, writing is a definite daily part of my work. I feel like it is a way to resonate with people and connect with people all over the world, like you and I are doing today. And um, it's just something that I really have passion for. So it's something I love love to do. Mm. Well, so you began with writing from a very young age. So it's been with you all the time, actually, hasn't it? You're right. It really has. And it's funny because I remember I remember the first time I wrote a story. There was a play group that came through our elementary school, and they would take children's stories and turn them into short plays. And I remember one of my stories got chosen for that, and it was like, my world lit on fire. But again, it was a specific kind of writing. You know, it was always about relationships. I remember always writing a story called like the mean teacher, because it was always let's explore, you know, how the teacher impacts the students. You know, I always had a sensitivity about me. I was always very in tune with the people around me. And so I think the way I dealt with being sensitive and in tune was to sort of write about it. So from very young, I began to do that, I think, before I even know, knew what I was doing. And so, Bridget, tell me something. You're a life coach, you're a writer, a speaker, a personal development expert. Those are a lot of things. How do you manage to do all that? What is your source of inspiration? <laughs> That's a very good question. 
Um, some days, <laughs> some days I don't manage to do all that. <laughs> so, <laughs> but I think, you know, that's a great question. It's a question that I feel like I ponder often. Um, I feel like the thing that sounds really good is to say, oh, it's the love of it or it's the joy for it. And I think I know that that is part of it. But there's also a pull to what I believe is a purpose of mine here, which is sort of to serve and connect. And I think whatever universal external pull serving and connecting has on me, the way that I choose to implement that is through writing and coaching. And so I think it's it's the dedication to the work, yes. It's the love of the craft of writing and the connecting with clients, yes. But it's also that I some days feel like it's what I was supposed to do, even if I didn't have those things. And so it's both for love and also for commitment and purpose. Now, you know, you're a writer and a coach, and I'm I'm pretty sure you merge the two things. So you try to yes. pair them up. Has this been difficult in any way? Has it been difficult for you to actually emote on paper what you already believe when you coach somebody else, you know, face to face? Um, That's a great question, too. I think the reason that that one thing has not been very difficult for me is because I think that coaching fuels my writing. So if I didn't have the coaching clients or the connections with people day to day, I don't know that my particular style and brand of writing would be what really truly resonates with me. So I think it's almost like I can't have one without the other because the stuff I write about, which is, again, you know, topics that just are universal. You know, it's how do we deal with tough relationships or what is special about female friendships or, you know, how does it feel to turn 30 years old? You know, all these Mm -hmm. things that we all experience. I don't know that I would have any pertinent commentary on it if I hadn't experienced it either in my own life or through conversations and coaching with other people in their lives. So for me, the bridge between those two things, coaching and writing, almost isn't a choice because to me, they're one and the same. Mm. Tell us about your writing process. Are you a spontaneous writer? So you get these, you know, these themes or these ideas in your head and you start writing them down? Or do you actually schedule a few hours in the day where you sit down and say, no, I have to write two hours a day or three hours a day? What is your process about? Tell us, tell us something about that, please. <laughs> it's so funny because I was reading, I think you may have sent me that question beforehand. And I was thinking, how, how uninspiring will it be when I say I don't really have a... But yeah, you I don't have to. <laughs> So it's, you know, I think my process, here's, here's one truth about the process. I read a lot and I, I don't know, maybe that sounds counterintuitive, but reading for me is inspiration for writing. Because I think when we read one of the things, particularly when we're reading nonfiction, one of the things that makes us want to recommend a book to a friend is that a uh, moment when you're reading something where you go, oh my gosh, that writer captured exactly what I was thinking, or I wish I could have said it that way, or oh my gosh, she gets me. So when I read books like that, it inspires me to try to write like that or uh, elicit those same feelings. So I think part of my writing process is being a voracious reader. As far as sitting down at the computer every day, you know, that's where having the coaching business stunts that a little bit because, of course, as anybody in a creative field can attest to, writing was not the career to get into to get rich quick. (laughs) So Hmm. there was this pull and pressure to make a living outside of writing. And writing is certainly you're in it for the long game. So I think in the beginning, when I started my business, I was so focused on getting that off the ground, not only because I love to do it, but also because I I felt that I needed to build a business and create an income. And so there were, there were many days where, I mean, I took crazy jobs, crazy writing jobs to keep my business going. I mean, there was a point I worked for two and a half years, I worked writing and editing obituaries for the newspaper. And it was just, all right, keep my writing muscle strong. 
but make money in the meantime. So the process has been a little bit all over the place for me, more based on necessity. But now as my business has gotten more established and I can kind of feel the ground under my feet, I just commit to one writing project a month. So whether that's putting out a new op-ed or committing to finish my book proposal or working on the Chicken Soup for the Soul book or, you know, even down to to social media and things that you want to present that have writing in them. I commit to one a month because for me and what I'm doing, that's the way it makes sense for me to do it. Um, But I think certainly I am writing something every day. Um, And to me, I've got pads of paper by my coffee maker where I'm writing. I've got open Word documents all the time where I'm writing. And I always want to make sure that I have a project at my fingertips because it keeps the muscle strong. Mm, That that is true. And how do you manage to keep your creativity alive? Oh, that's a good question. Um, Keeping creativity alive. I think I'm most creative when I'm either most sad or most happy. So you know, the middle ground isn't that inspiring. So when I'm sad or unhappy or disappointed, I open up my computer. (laughs) And when I'm elated or joyful or excited, I open up my computer. And I think that's what keeps the creativity because I find myself telling coaching clients, you know, when you feel something, write it down, get it out of your brain and write it down. That works for non-writers and people that don't enjoy writing because when you see your own words in front of you, it's empowering. So to me, creativity comes from uh, highs and lows. Mm. See, there's your writing process for you. <laughs> That's right. That's exactly right. That's exactly right. We just define. We just define the process. So yeah, more <laughs> emotional for me than structural. Shocker. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Uh, Now, you already mentioned, Bridget, you you already mentioned something about uh, the Chicken Soup for the Soul series. Could you tell us something about your journey with that project? Yes, it was really interesting. It was such a funny thing because I had been a a reader of that series when I was very young. And I frankly didn't even really know that it was still that it still existed. And I somehow made a connection with the, the publishing house that publishes those books. And they were looking for stories and came across one of mine. And it was it was a kind of a cool process because it's published by Simon & Schuster. So obviously one of the big four publishing houses. And they've, wow, have they created a business for themselves. But what's crazy is you read those stories as just a reader. And, and they're, they're always nice and they're well told and they're interesting and they're little snippets and make great gifts. But gosh, what a process. You know, you submit your story and they certainly get edited down to kind of fit the chicken soup for this whole brand. And anybody that reads those books knows what I mean. You know, they it certainly has a, a character of its own. And then you're encouraged. And most people submitting stories into those are writers, which I didn't realize until I myself had one in there. Um, I really kind of got to know some pe- other people who had stories in there and would read the bios in the back of the book. So it was interesting how many people um, were writers and that's what they did for a living. And and several of the writers have submitted and been published in lots of different iterations of the book. So then, you know, we were really encouraged to do our own book signings and market the books. And uh, they sent you copies and I was able to have a really fun book signing, which was kind of a weird it felt like a courageous thing to do because it was like okay it's a chapter in a book but what a fun thing you know we went to a bookstore and had a big group of people come and I was able to read the story and again it was a story about mother and daughter relationship and again you go back to it's just a commentary on the world around us so it's relatable and it was a really fun experience and they really were professional and wonderful and it was a great publishing house. Mm. So that was actually your first experience at being a kind of a true writer, isn't it? An author. It really is. And it's so funny because you hear people say all the time, you know, how do you know when you're a writer? And, and you, you, you hear the Stephen Kings of the world say when you write. But I do think for me, I, I, would, I would say it's tantamount to a runner, you know, the triathlon or the, the marathon. Those are the ultimate goals. And it's the same thing for me as a writer. You know, I, it felt like a win when I could get published online. It felt like a win when I could get into Huffington Post or, or Teen Vogue or, 
um, Marie Claire, you know, those felt like wins, but there is something about holding a book in your hand that includes your name. And I'll never forget in the little local newspaper, it said, come to the book signing with author Bridget Chambers. And it's like, oh my gosh, there's something about that word. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> so yes, it was a, I, it was a very, there's not that many moments. I think when you have a business or you are writing where you are able to stop and go, Ooh, pinch me. That was one of the moments though. Because like after that, you continued on to write your own book and you were just working on your book right now. You mentioned that before. Um, did this uh, feature that you had on chicken soup for the soul series, did it help you to, you know, to get your book in? Uh, to the publisher and then how are you get tell us your journey with this new book how are you getting it published what is it yes. about if you can tell us a bit about that yes yes yeah so um i will tell you what and and i i've always said you know i i don't know who should take this advice but it worked for me i have just always been a slow and steady wins the race you know i just things have not come to me nor have i nor have I made things happen fast. It's just things are, it's always been one slow step, one slow foot ahead of the next. So for me, um, more than the chicken soup for the soul book, what has helped me with the main book is publishing in publications online. That has, has helped immensely because what happens is your name shows up on Google, right? Um, and that's the age we're in now. Um, your articles are read by more than just your friends and family because they're out there. You're making connections with the people who are editing and the people who are publishing. So you've got, you're in that pond of writers and publishers from the comfort of your own home. And I think that that's been huge and it's happened over the last probably three to five years on and off. I've spent a lot of time publishing online. The Chicken Soup for the Soul, you know, I don't know that almost in any way helped me get an in with the publisher outside of it's a great thing to put in a proposal when you are proposing your book to agents. So I have yet to see if, you know, how much weight that will hold. It certainly helps in the realm of well, somebody else published her, we should read her work. I think that that's, that's the big thing because it is publishing. I mean, we could have a whole conversation on just publishing. It's a crazy world now. You know, people will say it's obsolete. You know, people aren't run, wandering into bookstores. You know, people think, although actually statistics prove that wrong, that millennials aren't reading anymore. That's actually not true, but it, it's kind of the thought. So you have to do things a little bit differently. And fortunately or unfortunately, writers have to position themselves in a way that is a little bit more like uh, a sales pitch where it's who's going to read this book and why. And for some writers, right, being an introvert sometimes goes hand in hand with being a writer. So that's a hard thing. So I think, I think if I had to take all of that monologue I just gave and put it into a, a sentence or two, it would be, yes, writing and getting published help you to craft and create a book and help you to understand what you need to do to get it published. But there are no guarantees. And that is, I guess, what also fuels the creative process is uh, where there's a will, there's a way and you're going to keep going. Yeah. And what is the title of your book? What is it about? <laughs> it's called Not Exactly What I Had in Mind. It's a mm -hmm. book about being in your 30s, sort of looking back on um, growing up. And it's not a memoir, but there are stories about me. There are stories about people I've coached. There's an element of self-reflection for the reader. It's sort of my unfiltered musings on um, growing up and what that means. And I talk a lot about sort of what I thought I would experience in any given time and what I actually experienced instead. And again, you know, I was inspired to write a book like that because you know, there have been times in my life, right, where I've doubted myself or I've been stuck. And God, what I would have given to have somebody else go, wait, you're not alone. So I think if there's a reason to write a motivational or personal development book, it isn't so much to give advice, but it's to give validation. So that's what the book is. So would you categorize it in, uh, in a, in a self-help 
kind of category or not? Yeah, I would categorize it in self-help, personal development. I think it's it's really for people who are in transition. And I think with people, you know, doing college differently now and facing careers differently than we ever had before, you know, more people working at home and wanting to start businesses and, you know, making bigger decisions earlier in life. Um, I think we need conversation around that. So, yes, I would say self-help. Mm. And how did you come up with the title? Because the title is really very realistic. You know, it's like you're talking to your best friend and you're just mentioning <laughs> it. So how did you come up with this title? <laughs> That's nice. Thank you. It's funny you're saying that because I remember when I'm like, well, how do I, when I was my, a long time ago when I was starting my business and I thought, well, how would I categorize this coaching business? And it, and it was something came out like, well, it's kind of like the girlfriend that you can stick in your pocket. You know, it's like you, you, she can come out when you need her. And that's how I, how I feel about, about the way I want my writing to feel to people and the way I hope my coaching feels to people is exactly what you just said. You know, it's sort of having this companion, but here's the kicker. It's the companion really is you. You know, we have, it's yourself. You know, we have inner, an inner voice. We have a gut. You know, we have strong minds and big hearts. And we actually know way more than we think we do. But that doesn't mean we, we can't doubt ourselves. So when I thought about, well, how would I encapsulate my 20s, the time after I graduated college, to through to getting married and going through different kinds of friendships and going through different things with family members and in-laws and all of that, that would be how I would encapsulate it. It was not exactly what I had in mind. And in many instances, it was way better than I ever thought. And in other instances, it was harder than I thought. So it's, it's a reflection. And I think in our lives, it's important to do that so we can continue to move forward and do things better or the same, or um, more improved, or less intense. And I don't think we can do that without reflection. That's so true. And tell me yeah. something. Now, you have loads of experience at writing, but did you actually work together with an editor to, you know, to finalize uh, the wordings in your books, in your book? So Sorry. right now, it's a great question. So right um, on, on my articles and Chicken Soup for the Soul, yes. Typically, what has happened in publications is that their publication editors will edit your work. You know, sometimes you hear stories about uh, editors just like hacking your work to death. I have not experienced that with publications. People are really generous. But with Chicken Soup of the Soul, I, yes, that, that was heavily edited down. So with what happens with nonfiction, for anybody listening who doesn't know, is that you don't submit a full manuscript to agents. You submit a, what they call a book proposal. So it's, it's a little bit... Um, it's tricky because that seems like it should be easier than writing a book. But in reality, in order to get a book proposal done, you have to kind of have your book written because you need your table of contents. You need sample chapters. You need an about the author. You need to define your audience. You need to show what kind of marketing you could do. You, I mean, it goes on and on. You need to define similar books than why they're the same and why they're different. I mean, it's very um, intense work. And then you have to go through and comb through agencies to find an agency or several that fit your genre, your experience, what they are looking for. Then what would happen is you would get an agent. The agent would submit, would take you on, submit your book to publishing houses, with the hope that the publishing house would publish your book. Um, so it's certainly not a process for the faint of heart. Uh, if you are Oprah Winfrey, sure, your book's going to get published. Um, but again, because publishing is so different than it was even 10 years ago, it's a little bit more difficult now to get your book traditionally published. Now, I don't have experience with self-publishing. I certainly learned about it in school and know several people that have done that. So that's always an option too. But in my case, what I'm doing now is I'm going the traditional route and it's a, it's a waiting game. But I, I guess I always feel like I wouldn't be doing it if I didn't think I could find success in it. You know, I don't think about it every waking moment. I just continue to do the work. Mm. So you had help on your cover and the formatting of the book and things. Oh, sorry. <laughs> So that was a long-winded answer, and I didn't even answer your question. 
the editor. <laughs> so you would yeah. <laughs> you would get an editor typically, and and this is really personal preference. Um, you would get an editor later in the game, one because because the thought would be the publishing house is going to have an editor for you anyway. So there's a little bit of that thought, like if I got an editor before I got an agent, maybe I'm spending money on an editor whose edits are going to be edited. Does that make sense? Mm. So um, I personally have not had it edited. I've had, I have an employee who, I shouldn't say an employee, she's, she's a, a contract worker. She works for me as my online business manager and she helps me with the structure to kind of keep me on task um, and continue to kind of be a second pair of eyes for me. And that has been invaluable and amazing help. But as far as an editor, no, I, I've not had an editor look at it. The publishing house, especially for someone's first book, first full book, um, would have control over the cover. Now, a great publishing house would say, we're going to work with you as a writer. But they have the right, in, you know, if you let them and you want them to publish your book, they have the right to exert complete control over your cover. So mm -hmm. I haven't come up with a cover because, again, um, I'm, I think I'm going to wait for the experts to help me on that one. Mm -hmm. And uh, when you did the Chicken Soup for the Soul uh, book, uh, and you you actually mentioned that they edited it a lot, how did that make you feel? Mm, that's so interesting. Hmm, how did it make me feel? Well, I totally understood it. It didn't hurt my feelings. You would have to look and see. Um, I think with Chicken Soup for the Soul, they have a voice they're trying to get across. So even though it's Bridget Chambers writing the chapter it's chicken soup for the soul whose brand the chapter speaking to so a little bit of my voice was cut out but I had no emotion attached to it and the purpose of getting that in that book was still fulfilled so I, I was okay with it and I think you know I, I, I follow a lot of authors on Instagram and social media and people are so generous now with sharing sometimes too much but um <laughs> specifically emily giffen is my favorite writer she writes fiction and she is always sharing her editing process and you see the edits that come back and back and back over a period of months and red marks and red marks and red marks so i always think to myself well if my favorite writer has to go through edits then who am i to not go through edits <laughs> yeah but in the end if it made sense to you then it's fine right correct yes Mm. Correct. That I would say that's true. That it's it's um you always want to feel like the work you're putting forth is genuine and who you are. So I guess I guess if somebody edited something down of mine or added words that didn't reflect truth coming from me or felt wrong or duplicitous, then maybe that would bother me. But I think um certainly people who are employed as editors and people who have made that their life's work are good at are getting paid for a reason. So I, I think, you know, you have to, you have, you do have to let go, I think, of some control um, when you're trying to go down a traditional publishing path, because they are trying to make money. And if you pick the right publisher and the right agent, hopefully it's much more than that, much deeper than that. Um, but I think I've tried to have an understanding for their investment in wanting the book or chapter to be good. And so there has to be a trusting relationship there. Mm. So your agent actually guided you in the direction of, you know, what your target market is and things like that? Yes. So for me, it, it's been something that I've really worked on alone for a long time. I've had to really read many, many book proposals of other people to try to understand exactly what agents are looking for. Because, you know, your agent won't really help you with defining all of that. You know, you have to show the agent that you know. But then that, of course, to your point, will be edited down because an agent knows better than me what a publisher wants. They, that is their job. You know, it is in their best interest. If they're taking you on as a client, it's in their best interest to make sure that the book sells to a publisher. So, yes, they will help you to make sure that the proposal reads really well, which is great. And could you give us a concrete example as to how you were given advice and how you adapted to that advice that you were given? Yeah. Um, one thing would be 
when you, in a book proposal, when you outline similar books, so agents and publishers want to see, so for instance, my book, what books are similar to my book? So there, there is a thought that you should not only talk about what books are in your same genre, but you should talk about why yours is different. What it, it, I've gotten advice on is that's not always the best way to go. Sometimes you also need to talk about why your book is the same. Because if your book is so off the wall that no one's written a book like it, you can imagine what a publisher thinks. Who's going to buy it? So for me, I had written down three different books that I felt like were in my same genre, and I had kind of talked about why my book was different than those. And after getting some advice, I reread through those three books and I thought, well, actually, there are similarities. You know, there's not sentences pulled from one another, but there's similarities and theme similarities. And so I was able to add that because that's attractive for an agent to say, well, this book sold X amount of copies and that book is read by a wide audience and that book was on TV. So that genre is something that's being purchased and read. Does that make sense? Mm. But that would be challenging to actually stand out from the rest of the people in that same field, isn't it? Yes, it's so true. You get so, it's so easy to get lost in, oh my gosh, it's already been done before. So that's why, you know, the, the um, exercise of doing a proposal is really good for the brain because you're not just getting the work done, but you really have to examine your book. And I think it's, it's, you've got to be careful, and I had to be careful to not say, well, this book's already been written. Here's the thing. It may have been written, something similar, but it hasn't been written by you. You know, it hasn't been written by me. So voices, just having the difference of a voice can make it stand out. But I think what I had to come to, too, in my mind was that's okay if there's other books that are intended for an audience like mine. You know, maybe an audience like mine wants to read more than one. So it's a constant having to remind yourself that you can do it too. And really, Chriselda, I believe that the pie gets bigger, right? Like, I, I think that if we can look at it like she was able to do it, and so I can too. And when I do it, another person can too. I think that's kind of the law of abundance. And that's where I try to live when I'm writing is just that, you know, if somebody one day just stopped and said, well... It's already been done before. You know, we wouldn't have Harry Potter. We wouldn't have all the great, wonderful literature we do. So uh, I think we just have to keep going. Yeah. And then the challenge is the biggest part of the game, right? That's what keeps you motivated. Yes, it's so true. I read something today. It was some, a guy said, actually, he was actually Kobe Bryant's mental conditioning coach. And I, I follow him on social media. And he said, stop perpetuating the idea that showing up is the hard part. He goes, that's not the hard part. The hard part is what you just said. It's the challenging part. It's the trudging through the mud. It's the doing it anyway. It's doing it scared, doing it tired. You know, that's the challenging part. And I think you're right. For creative people and writers, you have to want the challenge. Because if you don't want the challenge, you will not have the drive to keep going. Because it's a hard, it's a hard career. It's a hard craft. And, and it's, it's a beautiful thing. But it, it certainly, like I said, not for the faint of heart. That is true. And so like looking back, what would what would you think is your or has been your biggest challenge in writing and getting published? Patience, loving the word no, because no is better than no response at all. Not tying my perception of my talent or worth to getting published every time I want to. Um, I think it, it all comes back to the way I react to things. So I think, I don't know. I think if somebody went back to me, you know, when I was starting college, um, I wonder what I would think if, if it was 20, it's the year 2020. And if someone outlined, you know, where I'd been published and what I was doing now, would I be proud of it? Or would I be surprised I hadn't done more? I don't know. But, but what I do know is it was not exactly what I had in mind plugging the book but I think the lesson is keep going you know more will be revealed more will be revealed and I think it's the challenges in it like waiting for a yes or getting something published or finishing 
a book. As you said, that's what makes it worth it. If it wasn't hard, I probably would have gotten bored with it by now. <laughs> mm, yeah. Okay. Now I know you have a thought on this. Tell me, uh, Bridget, how does the term self-help, how is it changing with the new generation? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, how is self-help changing? Well, self-help is more uh, very true to the word. I think people are more self-reliant than they used to be. Um, I think people are more in pursuit of loving themselves, being kinder to themselves, being mentally healthy. You know, I think the biggest, the biggest um, proof of that is that, that things like coaching and therapy are not shameful anymore. You know, people don't whisper about it. You know, having a life coach or a therapist is like having a hairdresser. Um, I think that's wonderful. Uh, I always say that the healthiest people in the world are my clients, right? Because they're people who go, I don't know everything. I'm going to go and seek a coach. So I think people are way more accepting of self-help. I think they're in pursuit of it consistently. I think that it's a constant want. You know, we're always wanting to be healthier. I think millennials are, I am a millennial myself. I mean, I'm an older millennial, but I am a millennial. So I'm certainly not of the school of thought that says millennials are lazy and they're, you know, they want everything to come to them easy and they, you know, they want, they think they should have mental health days every day and everything is triggering. You know, I don't, I think, I think it's wonderful that millennials are sort of challenging the way things always were and they want better and they want freedom and they want to make the right decision the first time around. So I think self-help is much more accepted and I love that. It makes me happy. But self-help is, well, if you take, if you use the words literally, it means that you're actually helping yourself. So you yeah. don't actually need a coach, right? So how does the coach figure in this self-help thing? Well, a coach helps you help yourself. So a coach is like it is in baseball, right? A coach is not going to throw the ball for you he's not going to swing the bat for you but he's going to help you condition and develop the skills to make you a great baseball player so as a coach I do not give advice I stand in a space that asks questions to help you come up with the next best step for you so a coach isn't helping you they're helping you help yourself and that's why it's such an empowering career because I don't have to know, right? When someone calls and says, should I get a divorce? I don't know, but I can help you ask the right questions so that you can figure it out. So essentially, it's, it's self-help exactly as you defined it, helping yourself. Now, Bridget, I know you enable your clients to be in charge of their own life, and you use a very specific, you call it the plot twist approach. Could you tell us a bit about that? Sure. So it's so funny because the, obviously, plot twist is a, is a very popular term in literature. And so that was done on purpose. Um, I think that it's easy to say, well, my circumstances shape my life. And I'm kind of, I'm comfortable where I am, even if it's an uncomfortable place to be. So a plot twist approach is we start with the idea that anything is possible and nothing isn't. So if that's the truth, then I, from the get-go, am in charge of my own life, and I get to start making decisions that maybe seem rash or maybe seem extreme or maybe seem um, unlikely. But, you know, it's fun to watch um, clients, you know, move across the world or change jobs or quit their full-time jobs and start something different or, you know, get into a relationship that they were nervous to begin, you know, sever toxic relationships. You know, I think when when we empower people to trust themselves and take steps to freedom in their own lives, anything is possible. So that's the plot twist. Okay. And what would your advice be to someone who wants to pursue this career path? Um, I think, you know what, again, just like in writing, I read a lot. I think if you want to be a coach, uh, talk to a coach, right? Go get coaching. You know, the reason that I was inspired to knew what coaching was is talking to a coach. So I think like any career, the power is in engaging in it first. 
I think you can research by talking with people. You can research by reading books about the career. And I think I, I've always advised, you know, don't quit everything and start something new. You know, you take one step at a time and make sure it's something that you enjoy. But I, I would start by networking in, in a real genuine way. You know, find somebody in your circle who knows somebody who does this for a living and start there because it's always interesting to hear about other people's experiences. And then what do you think would be a nice way to transition, you know, from one career into another? Like, for example, you yeah. were writing, then then you were a coach, and now you're going back a bit into writing, you know, you're, you're getting your yeah. book sorted. So what would help this transition? Would reading help this transition too? Or is it contacts? and? Um, I think hmm, toggling between things, you know, I don't know if that's an everybody thing. You know, I think for me, it was, I just wanted to, I, I always wanted to fold writing into what I was doing. So I had to find a way to do it. Like I said, and it wasn't always glamorous. You know, I'd be up at five in the morning editing obituaries and that was what I was, that's what I did to fold writing into my life. But I think um, the best way to do that is to sit down and, and, and I would start by writing down, you know, what do I do like breathing? You know, what do I love to do? What do I do like breathing? You know, what comes naturally to me that I can do in my sleep? I'll give you an example. I coached a woman who was a physical therapist and she graduated, went to a ton of school for it. She was entirely dedicated, it, it, dedicated to it when she got out of school. But as time went by, she began to just despise it. She just, she didn't like healthcare anymore. She was very unhappy. It was impacting her personal life. So she came to me one day, hired me as a coach, and we sat down and I said, well, what if you weren't a physical therapist anymore? And she said, well, that's not possible. I don't have any other skills. Well, after some months, not only did we come up with what her other skills were and what she did like breathing, which was every day she walked into that physical therapy office, she organized the desk, she conducted the interviews, she managed the payroll. She was essentially a physical therapist who worked as a business manager. After working for a long time to get a certification on the side of also being a physical therapist, she got a certification to be a virtual assistant. She got her first client about nine months ago, and she is now fully employed, full-time, working as a virtual assistant and online business manager and is no longer a physical therapist. So I think, you know, the question when you don't believe you're doing exactly what you should be doing or what you want to be doing is turning on its head the idea that you don't know how to do anything else or that you can't balance two things because I think you have to start with where your joy is and with her her joy was just buried beneath the physical therapy it was always there right so it's something where you have to do some self-reflection and decide what's something that brings me joy day to day even if I'm not getting paid for it mm, wow that's that's a nice story there um... isn't that a crazy story yeah, but how did you manage to get her to see that? Was it also like, you know, talking with her through it and, you know, how did you get her to see yeah. that? You know, it's well, it was really funny when she looked at me and said, I don't have any skills. I just looked back at her and said, well, what if that's not true? Like, what if that's not true? And you see, when you're in your own brain, you don't ask yourself questions like that, right? Like, if I were to go into a gym right now and somebody put a box in front of me to jump on, I probably would think, well, I can't do that. And if somebody said to me, well, what if that's not true? It might, it might put a little doubt in my mind. Like, well, yeah, what if that's not true? So then we start, you know, big scale. What are your values? You know, we, we, we outline values. And then we talk about, you know, what, what was your history like? You know, what, what did you want to study in school but decided not to? What would you have done if money wasn't an issue? You know, what, all of these questions. And then little by little by little, She's gaining self-confidence, but she's also seeing things that were always there. She just couldn't see them before because of her own limiting beliefs that we all have. You know, we all have limiting beliefs. And so it's just, that's the plot twist. You know, the plot twist is maybe that's not true. And if it isn't true, then all of a sudden it was possible for her to have more skills than she thought she did. It's actually looking from something from a completely different viewpoint. But to get to that viewpoint, you need somebody to tell it to you yeah. or say it to you that you yeah. start opening your yeah. mind to another mindset, another philosophy, right? 100% true. And what's so interesting 
is what you just said. It's really the truth about writing as well. You know, that's the kind of writing that I enjoy doing. It's let me offer you a perspective. It isn't always that I have great advice or that I have an idea of what you should do. But it's just, here, let me help you give yourself the permission to see it differently. So you could actually even write a fiction book. Yeah. <laughs> you could actually put the plot <laughs> twist in there with a bit of your creativity, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> okay, you're so nice. And I and that, I'm telling you, that is so funny you're saying that because my husband says, yeah. well, I because that is my next goal. Thank you for bringing that up because that is oh. my next goal. After nonfiction is I absolutely want to write a fiction book. I have an idea in my mind. And my husband always says, my goal is we are invited to the Oscars. <laughs> you know? So, you said it's made so into a film kind of thing. Yes, yes, yes. So, Chris Alba, someday you'll be talking to me and I might be an Academy Award winner. We don't know. Oh, wow. <laughs> you better invite me then because I, you know, I kind of gave yes. you this plot twist. <laughs> Yes, yes, exactly right. You're you're invited. That's it. You are invited. If I'm going, you're yeah. invited. Thank you. No, but I actually see you, you know, but that's the thing. That's the challenge aspect of it, right? So you've always written nonfiction. And I think by you getting into fiction, it would give you another aspect and another plot twist to your writing process, yes. isn't it? Yes, it's so true. And you know what's what's very true about that is that fiction and nonfiction, like, aren't they in some ways the same? Obviously, we're not living in, like I said, Harry Potter world. We're not vampires like in Twilight. But there is essentially like I don't know how to write fiction if I'm not implementing feelings and thoughts and ideas from real life. So you're absolutely mm. right. Yeah. And in any case, most of the writers, fiction writers as well, they always incorporate some of their own elements into the story. You know, some experiences yeah. that they've had in the past, they have to. That's how you emote with your characters. Isn't yeah, it? it's, it's so true. It really is. And I love watching interviews with writers talking about just that, that, you know, mm. <laughs> again, I'll just use the Twilight example just because it's, it's so well known. You know, obviously, the writer of that book, Stephanie Meyer, was not a vampire. But I mean, what is the main theme of that book? Well, love. <laughs> so we all know mm. what that feels like. So love and fear. So it's it's interesting when I listen to writers talk about their fiction books, um, exactly what you said. They're able to take things from their own lives and themes of other people's lives and, and implement them. And, and that's why we like to read them. Mm, that's, that's what makes it more interesting. And it gives it yeah. its, um, you know, its element of independence from everything else. Yes. Yes, mm. I completely okay. agree with you. Yeah, great. <laughs> uh, Bridget, what does the concept of breaking into the industry mean? And how can we actually turn that idea on its head? Mm. Yeah, that's a, wow, wow, you're a very good question answer. I think, yes, that is, uh, really, it's like the question answers the question because it's brilliant. It needs to be turned on its head. Uh, breaking into the industry. The idea that we have to break in somewhere to do what we love to do is sad, right? Like breaking in just by its nature, like Alyssa's thoughts of like, you're not supposed to be there right? Like if I'm breaking into a house, I'm not supposed to be there. So I think stop waiting to be, to break in and, and consider yourself a writer when you write. Now, yes, if you want to, as I'm doing, be part of the commercial aspect of that. Um, although I guess I have to say here now, do not become a writer or author to, like I said, become rich or make money. It just is not, and it's not to say you cannot make money writing. You certainly can. If you so choose to go the commercial route, it's something you should expect and want for yourself. But there is, you know, a level of all that that I, I don't know who, who thinks it, but I do know that there's people who think, well, if I just write one big book, I'm going to make a ton of money and can do that forever. And it's really not true. But I think the industry, if you want to be part of the commercial side of it, it really does. I mean, and I don't want to sound cliche, but it's just you have to keep going. You you do. You have to keep working toward it. And you can't take every no as a directive that you shouldn't be doing it. And I mean, I don't have to list here because they're Googleable. I don't have to list the percentage of people of amazingly famous, huge, lucrative writers 
who were rejected a million times. And and I actually don't think I've ever heard of a writer of any big book I've ever read that says, yes, I wrote this book and it got accepted right away. You know, I mean, mm. we all know the story about who's the writer of, why am I blanking on her name? J.K. Rowling of Harry Potter. Mm. You know, she was, she was as poor as you could be in modern Britain without being homeless, writing Harry Potter. Rejected, 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 rejected. So you have to keep that in your mind. It's like wanting to be a professional athlete or anything else. It cannot be the end goal that keeps you motivated. It has to be the continuing of challenging yourself and having faith that your preparation will meet opportunity. It's uh, like, like that saying, isn't it? That it's not the goal that gives you happiness, but the journey getting to it. Mm -hmm. And I think at some point you need to have a passion for it. So you're yeah. writing because it's something that you're passionate about. Yeah. And then, of course, you're going to have rejection, but that's going to make you grow and learn as a writer and improve your writing skills. And when there is that divine timing, it's going to work for you, you know. But the fact is that you keep that passion alive. And if you love it, you're going to continue doing it, isn't it? Yes, I think it's that's perfectly said. It's very, very well said. The It is. It's the journey and it's the passion. And, you know, one of my favorite quotes is, What's meant for you will not pass you by. But, mm. but I'll add an addendum, which is it, it, it will pass you by if you don't know it's there. And the only way I know it's there is if I continue to try. Mm. So maybe somebody only, maybe a listener only has time to write a half an hour a day. Great. You make the most of that half an hour. You know, you, and, and I will say just, just as some boring kind of structured advice, Email editors of online newspapers. You know, there's a lot of places looking for writers. So start small. You know, start with, with your local online newspaper. Start with, with publications that have verticals where they're looking for daily things to be written, fiction or nonfiction. You know, start there. And just every email is another try. And even if 98% of them are no, there's the, the 2%. That's what's fun. So keep going. Um, now, we already touched on this a bit, Bridget, but you mentioned before that, you know, we have this idea that in this age, in our age, bookstores have uh, kind of become obsolete. But why do you think the printed word is still important? Uh, I love that question. The printed word is so important because it is a mirror of our life. That is what I believe. Words are our experiences shown to us. You know, words are the way we make sense. I mean, you think, wh why do we make lists on paper? You know, why do we write on whiteboards? Why do, why, why do teachers, why is everything written down? Why is everything about notes? And because the written word, even in that setting, is important. And you know, then you take it to books or magazines or, you know, articles that you read. It's wonderful to be able to, in your own fingertips and in your own brain, learn and connect and make sense of a concept that maybe didn't make sense before you read it that way. So that is something that I believe will never die because it's too important. And, and in my belief, it's the most important thing. And Bridget, if I say healing through creativity, what does that tell you? Oh my gosh. Healing through creativity. Well, that just gave me chills. Um, healing. Healing for me is different than what it used to be. It feels different than what it used to feel. Healing used to feel, when I was young, like it's a boo-boo that's been band-aided and healed, and now the scar isn't there anymore. Healing now through life experiences and whatever, you know, we all have trauma, we all have sadness, we all have pain. So healing now for me is vulnerability because if i can find vulnerability which means being able to own what i'm going through and connect with others about it then i feel like i'm in healing and i don't think i could do that without the gift of words both writing and reading um so creativity for me is not only an outlet for healing because it allows me to be vulnerable and connective but it's also the source of my healing and did it, you know, while you were writing parts of this new book of yours, the, you know, the 
the manuscript which you, you've given out to the publishers or whatever. Um, did you at any point feel this kind of healing or did you actually start getting emotional because you're sharing your stories there and some of them probably are vulnerable stories. So did it actually affect you and, and how did you deal with it or how did you detach to be able to write it down and not get too emotional from it? Um, yes, it does. You know, when you're writing and I'm sure it happens with, with fiction books too, but yeah, the nonfiction, um, when you're writing your own stories or you're writing other people's stories that mean something to you, you do get emotional. Like I, I remember reading parts of it to my online business manager and I would get emotional and I almost felt ridiculous because it's like, okay, I'm like crying at my own words, but of course I'd be crying at my own words because because they were emotional enough or meaningful enough for me to write them down on paper and submit them to a publishing house. <laughs> so of course they were going to make me emotional. So, and how I deal with it is just to me, talk about healing and creativity, getting emotional about it is healing for me because it means I'm owning that. So if I'm writing a, a chapter about grief and I start to cry about it, well, then, then I'm letting out the feelings that that theme brought to my life, which was sad. So I, I think it's getting emotional about something you write is natural because if you're writing the truth, that's how it's going to feel emotional. And that means you've written it well. If you you know reread it and you start getting emotional again, it means that you've actually captured the essence into your words, right? Yes, beautiful. That's a that couldn't have said it better myself. That's right. Okay. And how do you see the future, Bridget? Hmm. The future seems like. I don't know and nothing feels better than not knowing. I feel like I've stepped into after, you know, I feel like age, you know, like 23 to 33, I'm 33 now, you know, the last 10 years have been about put your head down and do the work. And not to say that I'm not going to continue to put my head down and do the work. And that's just in my nature. It's certainly the nature of being a writer, but, I feel equal parts trusting in the process and in myself and positively out of control, which I think is a good thing. Not out of control, like, you know, manic out of control, but out of control in that there are things that, that once you create, uh, things have to come together to end up in the way you want it. So for me, in some ways, I've detached from where this book is going to get published and when, because I know that I'll keep going until it does. And so I feel out of control of that aspect of it. And that actually feels really good. So I feel hopeful and trusting of myself and also excited that I don't exactly know. So you have a kind of an open mind and you're just going with the flow of things, which is amazing. That's how it's supposed to be, right? It really is. And I don't know if, if, even last year, I would have said that, you know, I think we, we think all the time when we must be in control and we must know, we must feel like, and I don't know, I don't, I don't know if that's true. I, I don't know if we do always need to know. I think that maybe in our sweetest spot, you know, when we feel the most mentally strong and healthy, that maybe what we don't know is, is the power of what we're doing. So I think that's where I feel the most hopeful. Now, maybe if I had talked to you last week or a different time or when I was in the midst of this book proposal, and it's really funny, Criselda, because I haven't, I haven't felt really emotional about much of anything like this past month, but I think it's because I submitted the book. Like, I really do. I mean, I don't want to sound weird, but it's like I had to birth the book. And once I did, physiologically, I feel like I changed. I feel like I was able to let go of the pressure of it because I put my head down and did the work and now it's kind of in someone else's hands and that feels good. Mm. So the thing is, and that's what I've realized as well, if you try to control too many things, that's what actually causes too much stress. The minute you let go, that's when you actually find your freedom and you feel free, isn't it? And that stress dissipates completely. Yes, it's so true. Yeah, like a stress is tied up in so many things that are stressful, right? <laughs> like, so we may as well, when we're in our joyful thing, which for me would be writing and for others might be another creative uh, avenue, it's, I don't want that to feel like stress. 
I mean, it inevitably will at points, but there's enough stress just in the world. So I, I would rather the joy feel like joy. Yeah. Yeah. Um, tell me, Bridget, have there been any specific writers or books that have played a key role on your writing journey? Yes, I love, I mentioned Emily Giffen. I think she's one of the brilliant character writers of our time. She captures human relationships really well. She's a fiction writer. I know she has a book coming out in June called The Lies That Bind. Um, I follow her and I absolutely adore her books. I just think she can't, she just, like I said, her, her ability to capture the way people communicate and love and lose and feel is uh, next to none. And then I love Glennon Doyle. She is a nonfiction writer. She started out writing a, a blog, what some would uh, label a mommy blog, but she's done much more than that. She's um, written books and she speaks and uh, she's an activist. So I really enjoy her writing. She actually has a new book coming out called Untamed next week. I really like Brene Brown. I think she's inspiring. I really like Elizabeth Gilbert, who wrote Eat, Pray, Love. So you can tell I, I definitely have a <laughs> – all those writers sit kind of on the same fence, and that's, that's that brave writing that tells a story, mm-hmm. but it, it always has an element of deep vulnerability. And mm-hmm. um, to me, that's the bravest thing you can be. Yeah, amazing. Now I'm going to I'm going on a complete tangent here, but I read somewhere that you often tweet to Gloria Stefan. What is that about? <laughs> okay, that's hilarious. Um, yes, outside of writing, what I wish I could do all day every day is sit in in uh, at Broadway shows. So you know when people say, "What's your favorite? Like, where's your favorite place on earth?" My answer to that would be sitting in a theater on Broadway in New York City, taking in the delectable theater scene. So that's what I love. But anyway, I saw a play called On Your Feet, which was based on the lives of Emilio and Gloria Stefan. And I was obsessed with it and dragged my friends to every possible show. I think I saw it seven times. Obsessive. (laughs) And um, I actually, uh, I met the stars of the show and everything. And then I one time tweeted Gloria Stefan and we had a conversation back and forth. So I, <laughs> I'm just a very big fan of her music and I love her life story. And yeah, that's, that's another part of my life that I'm very passionate about. Oh, amazing. Addictive. <laughs> yes, exactly. Oh, yeah. That would be, yeah. <laughs> I'm well, you've got to find the balance, right? <laughs> Okay. Um, Bridget, it's been lovely talking to you. I'm coming to our last question then. How can our listeners contact you or find your books? You can find me on Instagram at Bridge Chambers, B-R-I-D-G Chambers. Visit me online at BridgetChambers.com. Would love to tweet with you and Gloria Stefan. Um, (laughs) But I always welcome emails and would love you to hopefully one day you'll be um, seeing my book on the shelves. And I I would love to connect with, with anybody. Oh, that's great. Thank you so much, Bridget. You've been such a pleasure on the show. It was great fun chatting with you. And I'd like to already invite you to series three of the podcast where it'll be based on self-help. And I think with your coaching skills and, you know, all the experiences that you've had, it'd be lovely to share your experiences there. So. Oh, Chris Selda, I would love that. Yeah, you're a pleasure. I, I Your questions are, are amazing and really thought provoking. And I would love to be involved in I'd love to, to hit a ride on your star. So whenever. Oh, oh, great. Okay. So we keep in touch, Bridget. And you have a lovely day today. Have a lovely day, Criselda. Thank you so, so much for everything. Oh, thank you, Bridget. And thanks for coming on the show again. And we'll keep in touch, yeah? <laughs> yes, we absolutely will. Please, please let's email. Okay, let's do that. Let's keep in touch. And thank you so much again, Bridget. See you. Bye. See you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you for joining us on The Three Pillars. See you next week and make it awesome.